What up, Kate? Hey, how are you? Good. All right. Thank you for coming back on to the Mother Freedom Show. Our last <laughs> uh, video we did together was on circumcision. Yes. And we got a lot of great like engagement and feedback. So for those of you who watched it, thank you. And for those who for those of you who commented on your thoughts, we appreciate that too. And we're definitely going to do more hot topics like that. We're going to be talking about most things that involve birth, pregnancy, and postpartum. I actually saw a recent article. You know, it's so interesting how much nutrition conventional nutrition stuff out there is so outdated. Like mm -hmm. I was on lamaze.org and <laughs> okay. They, they I had, no, I mean, I wasn't just, I, I don't know how I got there, but there was a recent blog article called what should I eat with gestational diabetes? Mm -hmm. And you know what they suggested? Bananas. <laughs> well, they suggested low fat, dairy that's basically pure sugar that's what we give patients who have low blood sugar sometimes like we'll just give them a carton of non-fat or low-fat milk if we don't have um like juice because i'll usually give like orange juice and like two packets of sugar otherwise they get low-fat milk and it skyrockets the blood sugar yeah brings it from something stupid like 50 or 60 to like 90 to 100. Well, there you go. And I was just so shocked because this is 2023 and what they recommended for a pregnant woman to have were lean sources of protein, lots of non-starchy vegetables, healthy mm -hmm. fats. They don't even describe it. Well, they said olive oil. They didn't name any kind of animal fats and, mm -hmm. and portion complex carbohydrates. And what I learned <laughs> reading Deep Nutrition and doc, uh, with Dr. Kate Shanahan, I mean, she talks about Weston A. Price's work mm -hmm. and how he actually, I don't know if you've looked much into mm -hmm. Weston A. Price's work. Well, he went to study indigenous tribes and their teeth. Mm -hmm. And he found tribes that had no modern foods introduced to them mm -hmm. had perfect facial structure, had enough space in their jaws for teeth, no teeth crowding. I mean, like perfect. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with this, right, when you hear about that and then hearing what Lamaze.org, which is a huge organization on, on, I mean, a lot of people have taken their um, like classes, right? Yeah. I know they go way back. Hearing about Weston A. Price's work and then hearing what Lamaze is recommending is the complete opposite. Pregnant mm -hmm. women, I mean, humans in general need all sources of protein, like not just the lean, mm -hmm. like the jackpot is in the fat. For pregnant women, they're saying all this crazy shit, like, you know, eat non-fat yogurt and then you can do plant-based oil. Like olive oil is fine, but they never say, they never have that nuanced conversation that olive oil is fine, but... We're talking about olive oil that's coming out of the tree, being pressed, and then sent to market not too much longer because it can go rancid because it also has, um, like, the fruit sediment, which can cause rancidity. So you have to, they don't have any nuance. A good bottle mm -hmm. of olive oil might last maybe three months. Yeah. In a dark and place. Like, I mean. Mm -hmm. These clear bottles that you're getting, that's nonsense. Because, um. When I lived overseas, I lived in Egypt for a year. Oh. And so that. there was, yeah, I got out in school and I was like, I'm going to live in Egypt for a year because I That's make cool. weird life choices. <laughs> they had olive oil and they kept it in like bottles and like these things, but they were using it for so much stuff. And because Syrian food was a big deal in Cairo where I was living um, and oil goes on everything, there's such a high rotation it's not sitting around and it's not being um like hoarded or used or whatever it is sparingly it's something that is they're buying it a couple times a month because they use so much yeah and 
that's something that doesn't really happen here because of this watch your fat be careful of your fat yeah and, mm -hmm. and it's so important for babies to for pregnant women and their babies to get fat mm -hmm. to grow yeah. i mean our brain i think it's like 60 percent made up of fat so why would we think that mm -hmm. why would we suggest that having you know i'm just going to read off the list that lamaz Dot org says lean protein, chicken, fish, turkey, tofu, bison, lean beef. First of all, having a pregnant woman eat tofu is like the worst thing because of what the estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they keep citing what really makes me kind of like annoyed is they always cite how well Asian cultures do with tofu. And in Okinawa, where my family's from, tofu is not a staple meal. It's not a, it's not something that they eat constantly. Like they don't have tofu steaks. They don't have like tofu, tofurkey. They don't have like these weird processes. They have a few bites of tofu, maybe in a soup, maybe a fried tofu, but it's not a staple thing. That's not a meal replacement. Well, and in also, Okinawa, yeah, well, we're probably talking about, I mean, when we talk tofu, mm -hmm. the tofu made in, in Japan and mm -hmm. China, they're processed the right way. Yeah. They're actually fermented long, but the stuff we get in the United States that they make, they skip that process. Mm -hmm. So there isn't they really just any health. Shove it else. down in that weird brick. Yep. In Okinawa, I've only been there once when I was a small child, so I I only remember uh, going to the corner store and getting ice cream, but that's kind of where my memories end. My mother was like, it was like a silken tofu, mostly what they ate, because mm. they were usually like homemade. It wasn't something mm -hmm. huge that her family anyway purchased in the store they would make it themselves and it would be this really lovely like silken smoothie thing smooth thing yeah yeah exactly um yeah and it wasn't the main the main entree you're mm -hmm. absolutely right it was like a nice little like small dish because in in okinawa just like in japan they eat small plates of stuff family style so like a few bites of a fried tofu or marinated tofu or something yeah and i just want to touch on one more thing with what it does. I mean, they say, right, the myth, this is on the westonaprice.org site, mm -hmm. myth is soy foods are good for your sex life. However, there are numerous anima animal studies that show that soy foods cause infertility in mm -hmm. animals. Japanese housewives feed tofu to their husbands frequently when they want to reduce his virility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, I had no idea, but that definitely sounds like something a Japanese housewife would do. Another reason why having soy during pregnancy is terrible is I mean it contains these trypsin inhibitors that inhibit protein digestion and can affect pancreatic function and there's a lot of phytoestrogen in soy it can even increase premature sexual development in in girls or um, delayed sexual development in boys so stay away from soy I did not have it I mean I even bought it because I love fried tofu because that's like a Thai dish, but I realized, oh shit, like I'm pregnant. I'm not going to have it. So I really eliminated it. I mean, it sat in the back of my fridge until I tossed it and yeah. even soybeans. Mm -hmm. Dude. And I love, I love tofu. Like I'm not talking shit about it. I grew up on it. There's some really awesome, like my mom used to do like tofu fried in soy sauce over rice for breakfast. It was just like the best thing. I think we have to think that when you start eating things that affect your hormones while you're pregnant, regardless of all these lists that they say, you know, it can affect sexual maturity in girls much younger, uh, retard sexual maturity in boys. You don't even really need those things. You just have to think critically. Like soy products are known to affect female hormone, hormones in general. And pregnancy is essentially a, a dance of your hormones. Development, keeping keeping your energy up, all the things are this beautiful matrix of hormonal, like um, hormonal harmony. The point is, why would you fuck that up by eating soy, even if it's just a little bit, even, you know what I mean? Like, why are you gonna take that risk when we're already inundated with an environment that's shit on our body to begin with? The soaps we use, the air we breathe, the water we drink, even in the best of us, eating the food that we get from the grocery store like there's so many things the packaging it comes in your clothes have plastic all those things why are you even going to risk it with tofu 
you can wait. It's not going to kill you. And it may harm you. Exactly. It may harm the baby. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of healthy fats, this is what they list. Lamaze.org. Healthy fats. <laughs> all I just like to say Lamaze.org <laughs> all the time. Healthy fats. They say to have olives, olive oil, nuts, nut seed butter, avocado, seeds, fatty fish, eggs. And it's just funny because they don't mention the lard, the tallow, the duck mm -hmm. fat. Uh, yeah. everything seems, I mean, almost plant-based and it's just unfortunate because there isn't a culture that has, that has been on, that has thrived on a vegan, every mm -hmm. culture. I mean, if you've seen the, the, the show alone, have you seen that show? No, I've okay. heard about it. It seems uncomfortable. <laughs> well, it shows how important having fat is, you know, these mm -hmm. people are hunting, for for wild game and they tend to be very lean and they actually don't make it because lean protein is not sustainable it doesn't mm -hmm. build much um so why would we think that having lean protein is is good for the pregnant mom and the baby but um yeah so i just wanted to point that out because it's just crazy that there's still such this bs with conventional nutrition advice for pregnant women mm -hmm. well for women in general I have a really weird story from when I was in college. I took an anthropology class and my teacher, my professor was amazing. She had done a bunch of studying, uh, bonobo monkeys was like her area of expertise. And she was in Africa. I cannot remember the, the country she was in. And she was explaining to us the importance of like nutrition and what is important. Cause we were talking about the diet of these monkeys and how some of them, uh, what they would go through to get fat and sweets and sugar just and it was like meat and fruit and stuff or fat and fruit and she literally said that she was so deprived because they had to sort of like ration their food uh for the expedition that she stayed behind one day because she was starving for fat and sugar and she put water in a bucket because like the there something had gone wrong with their fat their butters and their fats and stuff and so that she had a handful of sugar that she put in a cup, she put water in the bucket and essentially the fat floated the top and the detritus and the dead bugs that was in the fat that she was trying to get stayed or whatever. I don't know. She somehow she separated it. And she literally said that in a dark corner, she just ate spoonfuls of fat and sugar. And because she was so depleted, she couldn't think she couldn't walk. She couldn't do it. She was sweating profusely. So she was losing all these minerals and electrolytes and the salt and her whole body was completely out of whack. And the only thing that she, that her body was like, get this for me was fat and sugar. And that's the way she did it. She picked off disgusting bugs, plunged it in water, let them separate some more and then just like zhuzh sugar in it and ate it by the spoonful. So that's something that's incredibly important in this notion that and it was a source of animal fat. Her body's like, don't give us this weird stuff. Cause they, I think they had like palm oil available or something else. She's like, animals, give it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly. And then she's like, I literally felt instantly better. Even as it wasn't even like in her gullet, it was just in her mouth and her body was like, oh good. We feel better now. Cause yeah. we know that it's coming. Yeah. And that's such a simple, stupid story from like 20 years ago. It illustrates how important animal fats and simple sugars can be for your body's energy. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's let's now go okay. from moving. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> let's go to well, let's talk about induction. So, do you know anyone personally that has gotten in induced? My mom actually has a really complicated birth story with me. And I've been asking her and she's like, listen, man, I haven't thought about it in a really long time. And then she started to think about it. And she's like, holy shit, it was really fucked up how I was treated. So I am born July 5th. I was supposed to be, be born June 5th, according to what the doctors told her. They probably used like the wheel and Nagel's rule or whatever it is. And so, and my mom was, she's convinced that she knows when she conceived, when her and my dad conceived because she had an IUD 
and it was removed only like a week or so before. I may be exaggerating the time, but it was a significant, it's like a very truncated period of time between the IUD removal and her conceiving. And so she's like, I know it was within this time. And I wasn't ready to come out. And I think they even tried to induce. They're like, nope, it's fine. Just go home. And then she's, they're like, come back in four weeks. This is Texas in the 80s. They're like, come back in four weeks. We'll work on inducing you. Truly, like, we'll, we'll do all this stuff. Because I think before they had just sort of like done maneuvers and tried to do it naturally. Texas in the 80s. Dallas in the 80s. And, um, and then she's on her way. She's like, oh man, I feel like I'm going into labor pains. I feel like I'm in labor. She said she had contractions. She said she was having all this stuff. And, uh, she gets there and the doctor is like, nope, it's taking too long. And she's like, no, but I'm still laboring. Like, it's fine. It's fine. We're fine. And he gives her the Pitocin anyway immediately stops her dilation at, I want to say she said the number was maybe five, um, maybe even less than that, but we're, we'll just split the difference. And the pain was horrific. And this is not a woman who does well with pain under the best of circumstances. She's just doesn't like being uncomfortable. She doesn't like being in pain. She's a bit of a sissy. It's fine. We love her. Um, and then they, she's just like, give me drugs. I need drugs. I can't handle this. So they get her the epidural because it's just so intense. She's like, I don't even know how to describe the freight train of pain that it was. And she punched my dad. She's like, this is your fault. She like, she full on hit him and then she grabbed him. And then she had an epidural immediately. <laughs> and then because the Pitocin immediately arrested her labor progress and her dilation of her cervix, she went for a quote unquote emergency C-section and then I was born. And this is all also to say the way we discuss wounds, the doctor, the OB who had uh, delivered me had lost a baby the week before and he was determined. He's like, I don't care what it takes. I'm not listening to any of these women. No one's losing a baby on my watch again. And so my mom was kind of the result of that. She wanted to wait. She wanted to have a natural labor. She was really, really keen on having a delivery as natural as possible. And then they gave her the Pitocin and just everything stopped. And that's something that we hear constantly. Every time I speak to someone who was induced or had a C-section to sort of like learn their story and hear what they say, it's always, almost always the same. Pitocin yeah. was administered, everything stopped. Yep. Pain increased, and then it became this unbearable thing. And so many of these women also do well with pain. The multiple reasons why women are induced. Of course, there's the elective induction, uh, but let's talk about some of the reasons. So one reason is overdue, right? Your baby mm -hmm. is overdue. Let's get this ball rolling. People think that they're getting a, such like a, a carbon copy of oxytocin and it's, it's absolutely not. It's, it interrupts the flow of yes, oxytocin, absolutely, which exactly. makes pregnancy and bonding so much more difficult. Yeah. This is all information that I'm going to talk about from gentle birth, gentle mothering by Dr. Sarah Buckley. And I love how she views birth from like a holistic manner, but completely mm -hmm. like scientific research evidence based as well. Yeah. So there's, there's a few ways the obstetric system induce women. One way is using prostaglandins to soften the mother's unripe cervix. I know that's such a stupid word. Yeah. Right. Or like, <laughs> I mean, I get it, but also stupid. Yeah. And, and so it's common that they use like a cervidil, like it looks like a tampon kind of thing that they stick up. Mm -hmm the mother's vagina, and then eventually, you know, if they, then they use, they say it's a more common, uh, gentle approach to induction, but prostaglandin drugs can unpredictably cause intense uterine contractions and fetal distress with mm -hmm. higher risks of rupturing the uterus, 
especially for women who've had previous C-sections. And it's just a cascade of interventions. So, I mean, I've heard stories where, yeah, women are getting induced and these intense uterine contractions are, are so intense that it doesn't even give the baby a chance to come back, like to, to recover. Mm -hmm. So it's just constant, right? Contractions. Mm -hmm. And that's why it could lead to, oh, your baby is under great distress because we just induced you. So now mm -hmm. you're going to have to have a C-section. Mm -hmm. So there's that little chain. Yeah. And another way that the obstetric system induced women is by breaking the membranes. That's so crazy to me because that's something that is simply illogical. If the membrane is intact, the baby is swimming in their little warm home there. I can't think of too many situations where they would need to do, take that, that archaic savage looking hook and just shove it in there. and go. Whoop. Every time I hear breaking of the membranes, it, it breaks my heart because that membrane is, is cushion. It protects mm -hmm. the baby like mm -hmm. during pregnancy and, and labor and removing that like this protective bubble, especially if the woman is getting frequent vaginal exams, breaking mm -hmm. the membranes, it's going to make it more risky getting infections. Mm -hmm. When, when I shared with, with my family that, you know, I'm going to have give birth at home. I, I had my cousin who's completely indoctrinated and, and she's a dermatologist and she was like, well, what if your waters, do you know how long your waters can be open? It days. doesn't matter. They can be yeah. open for days. Yeah. And she's like, well, what if you get an an infection. There's no way I'm going to get an infection because nobody's putting their fingers up my vagina mm -hmm. while I'm laboring at home. And so there is no risk mm -hmm. there. And also the membrane can seal back up. If you nourish yourself with not just food, but surround yourself with like people that are able to sort of like keep you from freaking the fuck out because you are leaking fluid, then you can sort of like keep it together. It's not something that, uh, is an end or an emergency. It's something that you must be mindful and care for in a proper way on not just a physical level, but like a soul level. And I think Yolanda with her last baby, she had open waters for like four days before she went into like a true deep labor and started the process of birthing. Yeah, my waters were open for two days mm -hmm. until things started, you know, getting more intense. Dr. Sarah Buckley, she shares about that, like, well, this is the thing with working with a license, even, even midwife, right? They have a certain mm -hmm. amount of time that they might not be able to continue care if you go past a certain time, mm -hmm. right? Oh, you're 41 weeks, I can't take care of you. Or you're 41 weeks, we need to get things going. Mm -hmm. I'm going to induce you you know, or, or else I can't take care of you. And so it's just really important that if you want to have a home birth to, to kind of go over all of that in the beginning mm -hmm. with whoever you hire, or maybe you don't hire anyone. So you're not under that pressure. And it's just a shame because the stories I've heard, yeah, so many women are under this pressure. And I love what she says in the book, there is no such thing as a natural induction. I want to understand where those words even came from. So like they induced me naturally. And I was like, well, those two words are mutually exclusive. Yeah. They don't go together. Mm -hmm. Because they, any method mm -hmm. to induce labor before both mom and baby have signaled their readiness for birth is not natural. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And that includes drinking shit tons of herbs to exactly. get into it. That whole like, herb that's... thing. I don't believe in that either. Mm -hmm. That's not because that's a that's herbs are powerful. That's a danger just as well. You can do herbs to help you release a pregnancy, just way you can do herbs to help you begin labor. Those are very powerful plants. It's not natural. It's from a natural source, but it is not a natural act. Yeah. Those two are very different. Yeah. And the bottom line is just let your baby decide when he or mm -hmm. she is ready to be born, right? Because when the baby signals the mom is by releasing surfactant from the lungs, and then the mom begins to produce oxytocin. So let's just go through the hormonal blueprint here. So baby 
says, I'm ready, releases surfactant from the lungs, goes to mom's brain to signal to release oxytocin. That begins the labor, uterine mm -hmm. contractions. And mm -hmm. as the mom is going through this, you know, we talk, we hear about first time moms having the fear of, of the pain, but what the, like, there's so much beauty with this hormonal blueprint. Like we produce, we as women during labor produce beta endorphins, CAs, catecholamines. Mm -hmm. So these natural painkillers where, I mean, contractions are intense, but I wouldn't say pain, especially your baby emergent. It's not like your leg gets cut off kind of pain. That's yeah. a whole different thing. And so we have these natural endorphins to help us cope and go through labor. So a common concern I get uh, recently from, from a mom that asked me, a first time mom, her concern with having a home birth was, well, what about postpartum hemorrhage? Yeah, I feel like that's always something. And I was talking to a woman the other day and she's like, there's so much that can go wrong. And I was like, hold on what are you, what do you think is going to go wrong at home? Like, what are your concerns? And she's like, uh, I could bleed to death. The baby could come out dead. And I was like, well, the baby coming out dead is a very different, that's, that's, I feel like that's something that's completely different. It's a tragedy, but that's not a complication that yeah. is like, you know what I mean? The baby coming out dead. I think, I think you need to listen to that sentence, but that's not a complication. The bleeding part obviously is a concern. There's so many reasons for all intents and purposes seems to be a hospital thing. One of the moms that uh, messaged me, another one, she wanted to see what I did for hemorrhage because she really didn't want to have any kind of drugs to prevent hemorrhage. And what mm -hmm. I told her was like, this is the beauty of a woman's body during labor and after. So this would be the third stage. Of, mm -hmm. of labor right and so that's why skin to skin contact is so important mm -hmm. because oxytocin not only makes your uterus contract but it also makes your uterus contract so you stop bleeding mm -hmm. and the only way to get that flood of oxytocin is after the baby is born put it on skin to skin don't let your midwife go do some apgar test don't let the nurses or doctors wrap your baby up immediately put your baby skin to skin contact so all the oxytocin can start flowing and your uterus will contract so it stops bleeding yeah and that's all you and, need and that's and then why when you're ready the placenta the contraction the urine will release the placenta through its, exactly its mechanism yeah a lot of women want to have a home birth deep down mm -hmm. but their partner might not be on board because they think it's safer to give birth in a hospital, even though it's completely foreign to the woman, it's not as comfortable for the woman. And it seems like a woman knows when they're giving birth in a hospital that there is a, a ticking clock. Like, it's like, mm -hmm. they know that. So it's like, what can we tell women like about home birth that, I mean, it's not true that it's more, you're likely, you're, you're likely yeah. a, you or baby dying is increased at, at home. It's actually not the case, you know? So I think I, I want to get into... Yeah, the cascade of interventions, starting with a mom. Okay, she's at home mm -hmm. and she starts to labor. Mm -hmm. She goes into the hospital and suddenly her contractions stop. Why would her contraction stop? Because she is not in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And her hormones know that. They, your body is so amazing. Women's bodies are amazing. Men's bodies are amazing too. The human body is perfect. It is, the, it's, it's only goal is to keep us alive and healthy and strong. And it takes all that, whatever shit we do to it, it takes it and it does its absolute best to meet the top of those requirements. But it knows when an environment isn't safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It knows that you are not in a place that you can be quiet and focus only on yourself because that's what you really have to do. You have to listen to yourself as you're birthing your child. And in the hospital, you've got all this clack, clack, clack noise, this chatter, these lights that are awful. Probably an IV. 
probably hooked up to something, you're definitely getting your blood pressure taken every 15 minutes, mm -hmm. half an hour. When the process begins in earnest, you're in stirrups, which are not great for anybody except for some sort of like sex dungeon worker. Yeah. Well, let's, then... let's back up. Let's, let's back up. Okay. So the woman, okay. her, her contractions stop. Right. And then mm -hmm. right when you check in, the doctor is like, okay, like you've got this much amount of time to get things mm -hmm. going. So then, you know, I've seen women like have their little Instagram clips on like them trying to get things going by yeah, walking sitting around, on a yoga ball yeah, or all this stuff, but it's around. not working because they're under like stress. Mm -hmm. They don't feel safe. They're feeling very observed. And so next thing you know, okay. We're going to, we're going to give you number some two. It's not their birth anymore. It's the doctors. Yeah. Well, it is theirs, but they feel like this person is like placed all this shit on them. Like you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to get a 1600 on your SATs. You're not going to school. Like it's that kind of like really weird pressure that is, has no business being in the room of a woman who's birthing another human. Exactly. Okay. So now a woman gets pitted okay and everything stops <laughs> everything stops because pitocin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier so it actually will stop your natural production flow of mm -hmm. oxytocin of yeah. maternal oxytocin and so mm -hmm. things aren't progressing so they start increasing pitocin so much mm -hmm. that it's too intense for the mom i mean i've heard amazing stories where a woman endures it and it's just it's just crazy but okay so it goes up it's really intense you don't get a chance to relax nor does the baby so what could happen next fetal distress uh-huh and then woman can't handle it so then she wants mm -hmm. an epidural epidurals increase the chances of a long second stage and use of forceps and they also mm -hmm. reduce the oxytocin peak at birth all of which may increase postpartum hemorrhage risk. So the prolonged use of Pitocin during labor for induction or augmentation has been shown to desensitize the laboring mother's uterus to the effects of oxytocin by reducing her oxytocin receptor numbers. So that's just another example of the cascade of intervention using you know, Pitocin followed by an epidural. But the epidural is almost always too late at this point. So then they just have to say, well, you can't have it. So you have to endure it. And then she can't. And then it gets even worse. And it just becomes this like worse, 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 fucked, fucked, fucked. And then the baby's like, I cannot take this. And it's the, their um, recovery time plummets. Their um, heart rate starts to like fall behind on the heart rate variability monitor, whatever nonsense that they do. And then, I mean, it's not nonsense. Okay, fine. But, um, and then they're like, oh shit, we need to get the baby out now. All of things that they've done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then that leads to a C-section or crazy coached pushing to get the baby out. Yeah. And so you can see that cascade of interventions. And then after that, right? you don't, they don't allow you to naturally birth your placenta. Yeah. And that affects how the placenta comes out. If say that you don't end up in a C-section, say you're a champion and you shove that baby like a champagne cork out of your body. And then the placenta is like, whoa, bitches, I am sorry, but this is, I am not doing this. And also Pitocin doesn't allow for the detachment Mm. Um, as well and then the doctor just like yanks on it or goes in there and like scoops it out and pulls it out scrapes which, it out sometimes yeah with another archaic looking tool that that's very painful yeah. that's where hemorrhage comes from mm -hmm. when it comes after that's a great place for hemorrhage to come I'm not saying that's the main place but that's a complete uh, violation of the placenta and the woman. I mean, obviously the woman, but the placenta is a huge, beautiful part of the birth as well. Yeah. And let's talk about the cord. If there's even immediate cord clamping, even delayed 
delayed mm -hmm. cord clamping is not very delayed at all. There's still a lot yeah. of blood that the baby isn't getting. So in active management, right, we're talking a hospital birth or mm -hmm. even a home birth with a licensed medical provider, active yeah. management, they believe that immediate cord clamping is necessary because if the cord is not clamped before oxytocic effect commences, the baby is at risk of having too much blood pumped from the placenta by the stronger uterine contractions. And so this Wait. area, yeah, so this has been poorly studied, by the way. <laughs> too much yeah. blood. You have too much blood, baby. Yeah. We are going to take some of it out. You're brand new to the world, but you can't have that blood. It's estimated that early clamping deprives the baby of 54 to 160 milliliters. And that's about 1.8 to 5.1 ounces of blood. That's which, a lot for yeah, a baby. Exactly. Which at the upper limits is almost half of a baby's total blood volume at birth. Mm -hmm. And premature babies are likely to lose an even greater proportion of their blood through early clamping because the placenta is still is relatively bigger in relation to the baby's body and contains more blood. Premature babies whose core clamping is delayed, they gain protection from IVH, which is intraventricular hemorrhage, a form of bleeding in the brain that's not common in, in this group of babies. And mm -hmm. so it's just like there, there seems to be no benefit from early clamping except you know, that's a procedure. We're going to get that done. It's on the task off. list. Exactly. And yeah. so it's just really sad because babies should get all of their blood. When I, you know, gave birth to Bjorn, I was like, okay, how am I going to know when, if I were to clamp, I ended up doing a Lotus birth, but you want to, if a first time mom is having a home birth, you want to clamp the cord when the cord stops pulsing. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, it's like, a, it's not a literal pulsing. It's, you'll know it's when it's completely, you know, there's like a candy cane blue yeah. and white wrapped around it. And you'll know when it's not vibrant anymore, when it's kind of mm -hmm. limp and it doesn't take very long. It's like under, I don't know, 15 to 30 minutes when the cord stops well, clamping. Um, also, starts pulsing. The Bjorn's cord dried up so quick. <laughs> by, by like the end of the night, cause he was born at like 2 PM, but like by the end of the night, it was shriveled. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's clearly visible. If you want your baby to have all its blood and antibodies and what else is in, is in the baby's blood? Iron. Okay, so if cord clamping is done too soon after birth, the infant may be deprived of placental blood transfusion, resulting in lower blood volume and increased risk of anemia in later life. And there may be a temptation to practice immediate cord clamping aggressively to increase volume of cord blood that can be harvested for cord blood banking this mm -hmm. practice is unethical and should be discouraged so that is one other reason why they might want to uh cord clamp your baby very quick who is there's a researcher there's a, a woman i can't remember her name but she's written a lot of papers about how much money the hospital makes off of a pregnant off of a birth because they it, they process the placenta, they process the cord and the cord blood. If there's any, they collect all that tissue and any fluids. That's why they, ha they have, they put like garbage bags at the end of the bed and they collect all that. They send it all out and they, I don't, and they can make six figures off of a birth. Six it's figures? A, six figures is what her research said. And I am so sorry, but I'm blanking on the woman's name. Yeah. Before I gave birth to Bjorn, I had some women ask me, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to um, bank his, his cord blood, right? I, I mean, aside from it costing thousands of dollars, first mm -hmm. of all, saving my baby's blood for later seems contra... <laughs> What's the word? Counterintuitive. Contra, yeah, counterintuitive. It sounds counterintuitive. I'm going to provide my little baby all the blood he needs for the rest of his life versus saving it for the treatment of something else that he may not even get later in life. Yeah, why? What is who who reasoned? that it's a good idea to bank cord blood. It's for money. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it costs so much, especially to make it private, but we don't have to get into that. But yeah, that's just uh, another way that the system wants to make money off of your baby's blood, foreskin, placenta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know something that's so insane? Why the placenta is so beautiful and so important? I, um, I follow this like farm page on Instagram you know why wouldn't you and um a, a, a cow gave birth she birthed her beautiful little baby squish cow calf and as soon as a placenta came out she immediately turned around and ate it this is a cow who eats grass the nutrition and the beauty of a placenta the cow was like i need that i need, i just spent all of this work expended all of this energy so as soon as the calf was able to sort of like move around and like get up and do stuff on its own the mother ate the placenta so like the the calf got as much blood as it could out of the cow out of the there was no cord clamping she just <laughs> ate the attached placenta and then that was how that went and it's just to take the placenta away from a woman, whether she wants to eat it or what, whatever she wants to do with it, to take that away and throw it, throw it in the garbage, which you know that they don't, is mental. And to make someone feel bad for wanting to take it home and to just like plop it down for them. Cause my friend was like, I would like my placenta. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but I know that I won't want it. I wanna take it home and keep it. And they were like pissed. Uh, well, slash, not happy, you know, okay, whatever. So they just brought it in some like weird Tupperware looking, hospital Tupperware looking container and just like left it. And obviously they were busy like dealing with their new son and they just completely forgot about it. There was no, it was just like this thing on the counter. The nurses didn't care, the doctors didn't care about it. It's like, if someone wants it, can we take a little bit more pride and care for this yeah. thing that nourished another human that has all these vitamins and minerals and like stuff in it? I can sign of C in my brain probably how how annoyed the nurses might have been. Because I mean, I get annoyed with stupid stuff too. Even though this is not stupid. Like mm -hmm. to this person, it's incredibly important. To that nurse, it was stupid. Well, we can end it right there. Oh, good. <laughs> now I feel like I'm just rambling. Okay, thank you so much again for being on the show with me. We're definitely gonna have have you back. <laughs> well, well, let's hope that they don't just yell at us on yell at me on this one. <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll talk soon. Uh, for those of you who haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and click subscribe. If you have any questions or comments or any other kinds of videos that you think Kate and I should do and talk about, go ahead and leave them in the comment section below. Thanks, Kate. Bye. Bye, Bjorn. <laughs>